I say this to my friend, actually a model friend of mine who had an idea, go get your no. If the worst thing you can say to me is no, not at this time, then when? Well, come back in four months, I'll be here. Well, not right now, then when? Well, this doesn't seem like the right fit for us. That's fine because you won't be here forever. You have to go get your no. These words don't hold anything. They're just someone else's words. The power is in you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Start Right Here. We are the podcast that puts the spotlight on the career paths of BIPOC beauty professionals, entrepreneurs, and creatives, as well as issues related to beauty and inclusion impacting us in the industry, as well as impacting consumers. I'm your host, Corinne Corbett, and I hope that conversations on this show help fuel your path to success. Hi, everybody. I am so excited today. You know, I'm always excited, but I'm super excited today to have a chat with somebody I've known for a very long time, really a legend in his field. And for a black man to be at top of his game in the makeup area is something that we really, really have to celebrate. Best-selling author, hit DVD, makeup artist for celebrities like Queen Latifah, Iman, and so many more people, creative global makeup ambassador for Fashion Fair, and so much more. Mr. Sam Fine, y'all. He's in the house today. (laughs) And it's my pleasure. Like, Corin, this is great. I mean, you know, post-pandemic, we were doing these. And so it's nice to be able to see folks and connect in a new way. That's just so powerful. Yeah, it's an amazing opportunity. We've known each other for a long time, and we've seen the changes in the industry, what we can talk about. And we can talk about what it takes to achieve success. But most importantly, I want to talk to you about why it's important to celebrate our Black creatives, because we do not do that enough. I mean, lots of people coming up may not even know who was in the game. So for us to take the time to talk about some of the people who are really good and then to educate people about what it takes to win. For sure. All of that. When I started my career 30 years ago, I had a wonderful mentor who was 20 years my senior. And Joseph helped me to understand that there were people who came before me and that I had to know who they were. I had to understand their talents. I had to understand their hand. I had to understand how to look through a magazine and how to notice their work long before you you know, got to the fold of the magazine to see who these people were. I think that is something that still stays with me. I knew all the designers. I knew all the models. It was part of growing up. So for me to Think about the Reggie Wells and the Fran Coopers and the Alfred Fournays and the... Craig Gatson. I got a shout out to Craig. Yes. So many wonderful people who came in this industry before me. I think it was important to learn about who they were because without them, I really wouldn't have a sense of who I was as an artist. Before we start talking about your career path, let's begin with some fun questions in our For the love of beauty section. What was the first product you ever bought? Grooming related product. (laughs) Oh, geez. Gosh, I'm the youngest boy in a house full of women. Yeah, my dad was there, but the women dominated the home. Three sisters, my mom. And my first product was probably styling loose. I'm adopted. And so my hair texture was very different from my mom and sister's. And my dad, of course. So mousse was something that was very different. And I kept seeing these commercials and these ads and mousse changed the way that I could address my hair. You know, I really curly hair. Anybody who has curly hair knows that if you brush it, that's the worst thing you can do to curly hair. But my dad and my mom would brush it and pick it out because they had really kind of kinky, coily hair. And that's what they did to theirs. And so they passed that down to me. And so when I learned what mousse could do, I was like, I've been set free. And it sounds crazy, but we see so many like mixed chick products and 
you know, Tracy Ellis Ross and Taraji Henson and Gabrielle Union doing so many products for so many types of hair. And I didn't grow up like that. So and I didn't grow up in a household that understood that either. So that was a product that really set me free. What's the most recent product that you tried or purchased? I'm blessed to receive a ton of products. And when I say a ton of products, I do mean a ton of products. Everything from makeup by Mario to skincare. Uh, gosh, there was a noble pancia that I thought was beautiful. The packaging is gorgeous and it comes in these individual packs. So I'm someone who will put on a lot of moisturizer, like I'll pump three pumps. They say one, I'm doing three. So the noble pancia comes in these little packets and you cut them open. It's so elegant. And I was in Saks recently, and I've never shopped for makeup often, especially for skincare, because once again, I receive so much. I usually go to the store knowing exactly what I want to get. And so I went into Saks and I ran to the counter and the beauty specialist described the whole system and it was so elegant. And I came home and I started opening up all these little packages and they're really beautiful. And I love serums, dry. A lot of people of color say that they tend to be oily, but I'm very dry. And a lot of us are. We identify with dry, normal, oily, kind of dry skin. So I was just like, you know, this was amazing. So that's been my latest discovery. I think skincare is always a discovery for me because I didn't come from a space of formal training. I'm not a trained esthetician. I'm not a formally trained makeup artist. So a lot of skincare is a big discovery for me. So I was happy to buy that. That's great. Since you're a professional in the beauty field, this question is kind of like, you probably have so many things that you could say, but what's the beauty advice that you live by or leave alone? Once again, I go back to my family. I had three sisters, two of which who don't wear makeup at all. You know, they may dabble in it a bit. And everyone thinks because their brother's a makeup artist and I send them product, I send them moisturizers, all these great things that they should be pros too. And it's not true. I live by the adage that makeup is a personality. So there's no right or wrong. It's a personality. And my job as a makeup artist is to bring that personality out. I love that. I love that. There's no expectation. It's not because everybody can't be RuPaul. Everybody can't be Cardi B. Everybody can't be Vanessa Williams or Iman. Everybody's got to find their space in beauty. And what that means to you and your time that is allotted to making up, your ability to apply makeup. Everyone is not an artist. You know, I always tell women, you know, you want to play with color? Go for great nail polish. It doesn't have to be that strong lip color that you really don't know how to wear and don't feel that you know how to really show that off properly. So go for it in different areas. Right. And I think that's great advice. Was the beauty industry a destination or a detour? The beauty industry was not a destination for me at all. I didn't know it existed. How can you make it a destination when you don't see anyone who looks like you? You don't see a spokesperson. You don't see a model. You don't see a black woman behind the cosmetic counter when I'm going there with my mom. So how can I make that a destination when I didn't even know that we existed in this industry? Come on, somebody, because that is the truth. We need examples, right? And so for me, as an illustrator, I was artistic my entire life. I've drawn my entire life. And that led me to attending the Art Institute of Chicago my junior year of high school. I came in contact with a wonderful mentor who was my teacher at the time, Craig Rex Perry. He was a brilliant illustrator and a black man. And me walking into class and expecting the Art Institute, you know, not knowing what I was walking into, and to see this brother embrace me and to pull me aside and say, you know, whenever I have a class, you can come. And so that was pivotal for me. You know, once again, you got to see somebody who looks like you in the space. So Craig helped me to understand that I could be an illustrator and I could live in this artistic arena. And then I took a job at a cosmetic counter to make ends meet because I thought it was something that was interesting. I thought, I honestly, Corin, I thought it was easy. Everybody looked so pretty at the cosmetic counter. I had hair. I had a nice ponytail then. And I was ready. I was like, this could be a space for me. Little did I know that I would enter an industry that I would love to this day. 
And you probably didn't see the connection between art and makeup. Mm -mm. Like I said, three sisters at home, my mom, you know, I saw them always doing their hair. I think black women in their hair, you know, those words are synonymous. So to grow up watching them getting their hair done, my mom used to sew my sister's clothes. She used to macrame. I don't know if anybody remembers what that is, but she used to macrame lampshades and artwork. She was very artistic in the home. And so to me, it always begins at home. For me, drawing and sketching, I think, was natural for me. But I never imagined that my artistic ability would translate to drawing an eyebrow, to lining a lip, to contouring and highlighting. And of course, I attribute my entire artistic background to my success as an artist today. Yeah. And I think that they used to say painting a face. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. They used to say painting a face, but there really is an art to it that may be different and no diss. I'm not dissing things we see on TikTok or Instagram, but the artistic ability to actually even kind of flawlessly match a foundation, for example, and to see, you know, just the little nuances in the skin. That is art. Color analysis was something that escaped me for years, though. You see all of these colors. You understand light and dark, but you don't understand the nuances. And the only way I understood that was to practice. Early in my years, we had to create portfolios. You remember those, don't you? Yes. <laughs> so back in the day, I had to create a portfolio of my work. And so that meant that you had to test. And what testing meant was that a model, a photographer, and a hairstylist and a stylist would come together to create gorgeous pictures that mimic the editorial and magazines so that people could see that you could do great work and you could get a job. And I was testing and testing. And I have to tell you, the practice and the refining of my skills that came to be from those tests, it was invaluable. And of course, no one knew that I was still playing in makeup. They thought that I had it all together, but I was still learning. Hell, I'm still learning today. Every face is different. Every makeup personality is different. So every time I go to work, I feel like I'm learning something new. I think that's exciting, though. You don't rest on your laurels that way. Yeah, and there's no formula. There is no formula. There are things you fall back on. Of course, there are products that I love and I know how they'll perform. But ultimately, it's important for me to work with a new client and be able to see them anew each time. If you work with someone like Iman or Vanessa Williams or Patti LaBelle or Tyra Banks or Naomi, and you've worked with them for over a decade, You've seen their beauty change and you have to change with it. And then also you want to pull in different trends to make sure that they know that you're in the market, bringing them something new every time. So you can never do the same thing every time, but there are parts of the beauty experience that never change. Contouring and highlighting, when you talk about artistry, you talk about me having been an illustrator, those things never leave me. How you impart those things, that changes a bit. Like technique might change a little bit. Yes, totally. Take me through the aha moment where you said, this is not just a side job. This is something I want to pursue. I moved to New York when I was 19 to work at the Naomi Sims Cosmetic Counter. Did they recruit you? Well, I had done some freelance work for them. I met them when I was 17, the first time. Wow. Yeah, I was fresh out of high school and I knew that illustration was my dream and I wanted to go to Parsons. So my best friend and I, he was a fashion designer. I was a wannabe illustrator and I wanted to go to college to kind of like compete with the best. And so I wanted to go to Parsons. I had attended the Art Institute of Chicago and I wanted to move to New York to become an illustrator. And I took a job at a cosmetic counter and they kept calling me. So I was one of those folks who you would see at different cosmetic counters for Naomi Sims in different parts of the country. I would go to Detroit and Chicago. And then they told me that they were opening up a cosmetic counter, their official counter in New York at ANS Plaza across the street from Macy's. And so I knew my dream was to return to New York. I'd only stayed in New York for maybe two or three months before I fell on my tail and had to go home. But this was the job that I wanted that would return me to New York and help me to follow my dreams. Little did I know that my dream would be 
doing makeup because I had no aspirations to be a makeup artist. I didn't have any friends in the industry that I knew that this kind of position existed. And then I met my mentor, Joseph Hampton, a wonderful makeup artist, brilliant makeup artist, who helped kind of help me understand the business of beauty, help me understand people that I should know artists, models, photographers, and understanding their styles, understanding lighting, understanding color analysis. And those things were so important because I always wanted to do my best at the cosmetic counter. But during that time, I was introduced to Fran Cooper, a legendary makeup artist and a, yet another mentor. Fran took me under her wing. I began assisting her with Patti LaBelle, who I would later work with and have a long running career with, then working with her for New York Fashion Week. That was really great, you know, because you came in contact with Naomi Campbell and Veronica Webb and Tyra Banks. And so that was really great. But I still wasn't sure that this was the career for me. I just enjoyed working in the medium because I didn't really understand what it took and I didn't know what it would take to be a freelancer. But I began testing building my portfolio, working with other makeup artists, working with aspiring models, and it just clicked. Uh, assisting Frank Cooper, she introduced me to Kevin Aquan, the king of makeup, and started doing all of these great fashion shows with all these top models. And one day I was still working behind the cosmetic counter and I got a phone call from Naomi Campbell asking me to work with her for an assignment, which was People's 50 Most Beautiful People. And they used to photograph and do all of these sittings that were very special at the time. They weren't picking up stock photos. They were doing, you know, actual photo shoots for it. And it was the beginning of my career working with not only a celebrity, but getting fired from the a counter because I kept taking off. <laughs> you know, so I kept calling out of this job. And so at a certain point, they were like, Sam, we've had enough and we're going to let you go. And from that point, I was 21 years old. I stayed in New York at the cosmetic counter for about a year and a half, almost two years, got fired. And I've been a freelancer ever since. Wow. You know, I always say when people say they've been fired, I always say congratulations, because it is truly the permission to step out into the next chapter. Yeah, if you embrace it. Yes. Corin, you know, you cannot be a freelancer and not embrace change. Right. And not evolve as well, because this world out here is changing right in front of us. I was going to say, you just jumped right in, but you didn't because you were assistant Fran. So you were picking up the skills and seeing how the industry worked. Mm-hmm. And you were content with that until this opportunity came up because you weren't thinking about it. I was like, okay, this is cool. I was also a dresser for Audrey Smaltz on her ground crew. Get out. Everybody knows Miss Audrey. (laughs) You have to understand the industry in every form that it takes. So dressing models, understanding how fashion shows work. I assisted many stylists dressing and carting clothes and doing all of that. I assisted makeup artists. And also I still had aspirations to be an illustrator. And I didn't want to be someone who was a jack of all trade, the master of none. So once I started assisting Fran Cooper, she introduced me to Kevin Aquan. I realized that this was a real business and this was something that I could thrive in. People started to notice my talent. They started to say that I had a great style and a great hand at it. And I started to take it seriously. And so I put down my drawing pencils and picked up makeup pencils and brushes. And when I took it seriously, it was when I started to see other clients who took me seriously. Patti LaBelle, when Frank Cooper wasn't available, Patti called me a few times until we had a chance to work together. And the first time I worked with her was her first Grammy award and my first time working with an artist for the Grammys. So I'm going to go back to something. How do you think that working at the counter helped you as you transitioned into this new role, an expanded role as a makeup artist? There's no difference from the celebrities that I work with and the women that I would meet at the cosmetic counter. It prepares you for everything. It prepares you for every personality, for the woman who doesn't want eyeshadow or who wants it all. 
it prepares you for every personality. And those are the people skills. Many of the greats have worked at cosmetic counters. And to me, I call it the real school of beauty. Mm. It's the place that you really come in contact with real women, with real concerns, and that will never change. Whether you're working with celebrities or models, they always have a perspective about their beauty. There's always still a slight insecurity about one or two things that you have to know and you have to help them overcome, whether that's by your skills or your voice. You've done so many firsts. Then you were the first Black spokesperson. For Revlon. Right. Was that Veronica Webb was there? It was, yeah. You know what? I'm going to tell you. We went to Atlanta. I was on that trip. Atlanta, you and Idris, Veronica and a bunch of editors. I was one of those editors. Wow. With Revlon in nine, we won't even say, but you know, it was. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking about that after I did the question. That's a- that's the first time. I knew Idris already, but I don't think I spent much time with you before that. How did the Revlon spokesperson deal come about? As organic as every deal, every relationship that I've had has been an introduction from a model or celebrity. I don't think the industry has always known what to do with artists of color. They only know it's in respect to the models and celebrities we work with. So when I started assisting Kevin Aquan and Frank Cooper, Veronica was doing all the shows, obviously. And so we met there and she ended up in my chair. She's from Detroit. I'm from Chicago. You know, we just bonded. And she asked if I was available for a job. And one thing turned to the next and we became a team. Veronica has been one of my greatest champions. In fact, she wrote the foreword for Fine Beauty. And there's one thing that always stands out. I can't even remember the book, but I do remember this one sentence she wrote. And she said, I opened the door for Sam and he rearranged the furniture. That is a great quote. You said something really powerful there that the industry does not know what to do with creatives of color. And if we think about Chucky Amos and hair and Oscar James and Johnny Wright, all these great creatives who we know and, you know, people in the community know, but are not celebrated like a Fakai before he had product or Bay. The level is not the same. They don't know how to open our salons. They don't know how to capitalize on our talent in the same way that they do with a Serge Normand. And these pairings and opening salons and bringing them into these spokesperson positions. Because you also have to understand the audience first. It's not about me. I'm a conduit to my audience. But if you don't understand the audience, then you won't understand me. So meeting a Veronica Webb and her introducing me to Jerry Backus Glover. Oh, Jerry. Oh, my goodness. Bring it back memories. Thank you. And I stay in touch with Jerry to this day. Wow. Jerry was a president. I hope I'm not getting that wrong, but she was a president at Revlon and she was in charge of the color style brand. And so when Jerry met me, I did her makeup for a brunch because I was also doing Veronica. And she was like, I've never had anyone do my brows like this. These are the rooms that we aren't invited into. So we never have these experiences with the C-suite men and women. And if you can't have that exchange, then you don't get an opportunity to become a spokesperson. You don't get a chance to be discovered. And so that changed my life. I had never been media trained before. I had never learned how to turn a question around. I had never learned how to do a morning show. And Revlon was the brand that really changed that for me. Yeah, how to make the most of three minutes. But also, I was surrounded by multidimensional women. Veronica Webb, Tyra Banks, Naomi Campbell. This was the definition of supermodeldom. These are girls who could walk and talk. They weren't just doing runway, they were doing print, and they were also taking contracts that allowed them to speak. And Veronica, as brilliant as she is, she was a blueprint to me. These women were blueprints to me on how to do so much more than simply pick up a brush. Right. Oh, my goodness. The next spokesperson role was with CoverGirl. Yeah. Another wonderful opportunity to talk about diversity. 
to bring diversity to a brand. CoverGirl has always been such a huge supporter. I was working with CoverGirl with Nikki Taylor, even before I was working with Tyra Banks. A lot of people don't realize that many of the artists of color, Reggie Wells, Roxana Floyd, we had careers that began in general market. So to get a job doing Revlon ads, I had worked with Daisy Fuentes, Veronica Webb, many others, but going to CoverGirl and, you know, these brands, it's a very small world in cosmetics. So people know, are these the people who are the artists who are doing cosmetic ads? And so they called me to work with Nikki Taylor. And then I'd started to work on ads with Tyra when she became a cover girl. And so it wasn't long after that, that I became a spokesperson. And it just became a natural thing for me because once again, raised with these women, coming up with Vanessa Williams, watching these girls who could sing, dance and act. It was just part of my DNA because I had been taught by these women how to be so many things in this industry, not just to be one thing. The fact that you worked on Nikki Taylor is just, (laughs) well, it's not mind blowing because we always have to know everything. Everything. But we may be categorized as a quote unquote specialist, although we are knowledgeable about all things because that's how we're raised. <laughs> that's- we're born into their world. So to think that I could come into makeup and not know how to do a white girl, I'm like, first of all, it's easier. There aren't the nuances in skin tone and discoloration and very tone. It's a much easier palette. Let me say that. And to work with white models, it actually is so much easier. Every product shows up more clearly. You don't have to fight against this beautiful brown background. Everything shows up that it was as it was meant to because most of the cosmetics were made with them in mind. You know, I was very fortunate at early age to meet Scavulo and to work with him and to have a Cosmo cover. And he would pull me in all the time. And it wasn't just black models. They're always photographers and fashion editors, and you always remember them and everyone knows them. The people who just see past race and they simply see talent. And I guess having been an assistant to Fran and Kevin opened up doors, obviously, but for them to anoint me and to be welcomed into the Scavulo studio. That's major. That was wonderful. Speaking of print, you have had some of the most iconic covers <laughs> in print magazines <laughs> featuring <laughs> so many of our favorites. Do you have favorite covers from through the years? Oh, yeah. Can you tell us about a couple of them? Gosh, Mary J. Blige with the blonde hair for Essence cover. It was the change of it all. Nowadays, we see lace front wigs, and we see makeup, and we see all of this. At the time that I was working for Essence, these things were a bit of a mystery. It was like, Robin Givens have extensions. I know Naomi has extensions, but I don't really know. You know, and it was still a mystery whether a celebrity did herself for the red carpet or whether a makeup artist was behind it. We didn't have social media, and these things weren't covered. So to work with Mary J. Blige since her second single, Real Love. I did the music video for that. And to watch her evolve, that is the best space to be in as a makeup artist, to be a part of that evolution. And I had done several covers of Essence with her prior to that, but that cover was definitive. It was the change of Mary J. Blige. First of all, I had always seen Mary as a beauty. No matter how many baseball jerseys, baseball hats she would put on, no matter how many Tims she would wear, I always saw her beautiful features. And that, I think, is something unique to our community. We always see the beauty. And that cover was revolutionary in the sense that you just saw a different side of Mary. And I think that Mary saw a different side of herself. And we saw how that has changed her beauty standard, for sure. Alec Black. Another Essence cover. Oh, man, that was fantastic. Thank you. That cover was groundbreaking. I wasn't working there at the time. I'm just saying that as a consumer, as a magazine person, that was a groundbreaking, absolutely gorgeous cover. 
but we didn't always get the chance of getting the supermodels coming to Essence. Or if they did, they would ask to bring their team. And what I enjoyed about Essence, Essence was my vote. It was my place to play. It was my opportunity to bring in celebrities and to add my spin. Monique's first Essence cover, Gabrielle's first Essence cover, Vanessa Williams' Kiss of the Spider Woman cover. You know, working with Mickey Taylor, the beauty and covers editor at the time, was very special because there was this ability to come in and discuss what you were gonna do to change a celebrity? Are we going to do finger waves? Is she going to sit in the dryer all day? They weren't coming to you in a way that with their own teams that already knew them and would only do what they already knew them to be. We had the opportunity to be introduced to them and to vibe off of what you wanted them to be. It was character driven. It wasn't just about just another cover. It was an opportunity to change the way that people saw them. And so I enjoyed that opportunity so much and went in there and argued my way through it. Every cover try. I think because of that perspective, there was never a confusion when you looked at an Essence cover where you could look at a Glamour, a Harper's Bazaar, maybe not Vogue, but Mademoiselle, whatever, and cover up the logo and not be clear on what magazine it was. Mm Mm-hmm even if it was a Black actress or a model. So doing that not only showcased creativity of the Essence team as well as the creatives involved, but it also showed whoever the subject was in a new light that could get them new roles, new opportunities. But isn't that the job of the magazine? I used to flip through and buy all the magazines because I wanted to see Kevin Aquan turn Linda Evangelista out in a way that he hadn't done the prior month. Now she had red hair, then she was blonde, then she was a brunette. Christy Turlington, she cut her hair. Naomi Campbell now has blonde hair. Naomi took her extensions out. You were waiting to see what would come next. And the beauty of that also helped me to establish relationships in a way that I couldn't have dreamed. I worked with Anita Baker because of Essence Magazine. I was introduced to Monique because of Essence Magazine. And that relationship lasted a long time into her Golden Globe win. I did her for that night for Precious. So those were relationships that you established. And it was an introduction to their next level of glam. All right, let's talk about your association with Fashion Fair the first time, because one of the things that's wonderful that we'll get to later is that you've gotten a chance to come home again in a new way. But let's talk about Fashion Fair, because it is, again, an iconic cultural touchstone for the Black community in that they saw us. It was a brand that saw us. Yes, and only us. Right. And only us. We're trying to be everything to everybody. When you talk about me becoming a spokesperson for Revlon, that was when they introduced Color Style and signed Ron Webb as the first African-American model to a cosmetic contract. You talk about me becoming a cover girl spokesperson. That was when Brandy and Tyra and then Queen Latifah were cover girls. And when Queen Latifah released the Queen Collection, that's when I rejoined Cover Girl. As far as resumes go, I always think about legacy. And I'm from Chicago, so I've always known about Fashion Fair and and John Johnson and Eunice Johnson. In fact, I had the pleasure of working with Eunice Johnson early in my career for an Ebony Fashion Fair ad. Those are the things you check off your list, like working with Michael Jordan, working with Oprah, and working with the Johnsons. They're Chicago royalty. So having the opportunity to work with Fashion Fair didn't come to me. I went to them. I love that. (laughs) I always tell artists that you can't wait for someone to come and knock at your door. Sometimes you have to schedule meetings. Sometimes you have to send DMs. Sometimes you have to pick up the phone for someone that you may not know, but you think needs to know you. You believe deeply. You need to know me. And when I saw that fashion fair was changing and that they were hiring different presidents and CEOs, and there was a shift afoot. I could see it. It was in the trades. And I picked up the phone and called, and they weren't ready for me yet. That was a president before the president that I then reached out to again. When I saw the hands had changed, the roles had changed yet again, I reached out to Clarissa Wilson. I reached out to Desiree Rogers, their then CEO, 
And I ask them, you know, hey, let's have a meeting. I want to be a part of this brand. And for me, legacy for my career speaks to the brands that I'm associated to, the celebrities that I'm associated to. It's not just another check for me. It's about people who believe in us and are willing to put their money where their mouth is and in both product and support. Support being able to have a spokesperson to make it easy for women to understand how to put on makeup. When I was with CoverGirl, they bought into the DVD. I had done book appearances prior to that with other brands. And so I want to make sure that they believe in us and they support us. So reaching out to Fashion Fair was pivotal for me. And that was the first co-branded collection that I had. And that was really important for me too. And I don't want to skip over this because I did mention it in the opening because it is a feat for a black makeup artist to have a best-selling book. Mm. It is. How'd you get that deal? How'd you get the book deal? Did they come to you? Did you go to them and say, I have a book idea? I sure did. I sure (laughs) did. I was working with Patti LaBelle on her New York Times bestselling book, Don't Block the Blessing. I never forget doing the photo shoot for that. And her editor was there from Penguin Putnam. And I said to them, I said, you know, hey, Mary, you know, I have a book proposal that I'd love to send to you. This is before email. You had to drop things off. I had boards that I established and that I'd set up for them. And she said, sure, drop it off. She reviewed it. And I had a book deal within a week. Wow. It's the thing that dreams are made of. But once again, you have to see it for yourself. Because if you're waiting for somebody to come and say, hey, Sam, you've had a great career. You've had a great career like Bobby Brown. You've had a great career like Kevin Aquan. They both have books. Why isn't there a book that speaks to Black women in the same way that their books speak to general market? And, you know, without just one or two Black women to be an example. Of the entire race. Right. So I said, you know what? I'm working with all of these wonderful celebrities. I've done all these great music videos. I was like, you know what? Now's a great time for me to pitch this. And she snapped it up immediately. And I was 27 years old. I didn't even know what I was doing at the time, but I knew that our voice needed to be heard. And I didn't want to sit around and look at Another Bobby Brown book that was wonderful for her audience, that Kevin Aquan, wonderful for his audience. And I felt like there was an audience that had not been tapped into and a woman of color who's never spoken to fully, that just to be able to see a black woman on a book cover and be called beautiful, like that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, you belong in the pages, but do you belong on the cover? And a brown skinned woman. I was about to go there. Yes, yes, yes. Because that's validation. Once again, I see you. I see your beauty. I want to celebrate it. And that is why so many people purchased it. And it's kind of like something you keep for yourself. And that is why people still have it on their shelves in their homes. People still have the book. I don't care if you were 27. People still have the book because it means something to them. Culturally. And I don't think that we realize what the culture really is about. Seeing ourselves, it's a language that we speak. It is a communication that sometimes only we can have with one another. And to be able to have done that book at such an early age, I constantly reflect on it because it changed my entire life. And so when you talk about becoming a spokesperson for other brands or where I want to go with my career, I wanted to lend myself to fashion fair. I wanted to be a part of a heritage brand that I felt that I could really go in and make change. It wasn't a brand that was for everyone. It was a brand that was born out of the need for Black women and being left out. And still as a makeup artist who still has, you know, makeup's an emotional purchase, being in this industry, knowing what it's like to be left out, walking into the room and only being the only person of color there. I know what that's like. So how can we continue to affirm and move this conversation along and change the narrative is to become a part of the brands. Right. And that is true. Become a part of the brand. And although there has been movement in the industry, There is still nothing like knowing that somebody sees you. 
Because you can't just be an additive. Yes, we love Hallie. Yes, we love Vanessa. But we also know the issues with colorism. We know that Hallie and Veronica Webb and Vanessa Williams, Beyonce being there for L'Oreal, Vanessa being there for L'Oreal, Hallie being a spokesperson for Revlon. It's still hard to feel fully embraced when they don't have a range of beauty that speaks to you. So it changes the way you see yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've been to so many over the course of my career, so many events, especially having worked at mostly general market magazines, where you go to the event and they're like, oh, we have this new range. And you look and you see nothing for you. Or a brand plays themselves and says, oh, this one's for you and puts it on you. And then they have nothing. They have nothing to say when it doesn't turn. I had that happen with a brand that had this color changing technology. So you put it on, it was adjust to your skin tone. And they put it on my hand. It didn't adjust. It was still beige. It was still beige. It was still beige. They had no idea what to do. It's so daunting. And so you imagine what my mom, my three sisters are dealing with. And my sisters out there who are dealing with trying to find the basics of beauty. You have brands who are doing color extensions, which is lovely, but without a spokesperson, without coming to the events that we are at, whether that's homecoming, whether that is Essence Music Festival, whether that's Jazz Fest, whether that is the concerts, you got to come to a place, you got to arrive at a space where we can really have a conversation about beauty. And it's not just preaching to us from the counter. It's about putting their money where their mouth is and making sure that we are connecting with these brands. And the thing that I love, I will say about Gen Z in particular, is they will look at all of the receipts. You can write a check to the NAACP, but they will look at everything that you do and then call you out. And have done. And have done and make the connection between what is lip service and performative and what is reality. And that is a cautionary tale, especially in the beauty industry, where you see us as super consumers Mm -hmm. because we do enjoy a good beauty product in our community. We spend disproportionately on beauty and are we satisfied. And we've spent so much because we're not finding what we need. So you see that and you're just looking at green, but there comes a time when people realize what, the bottom line is for you, and it's not really about the money. I mean, it's about the money, but it's not about the consumer. And that's what color extension is to me. I think a lot of people want to venture into doing darker shades. Okay, that's great that you've done this wonderful foundation, and it may work. Where's the powder? Where's the loose powder? Where's the pressed powder? Where are the skin products that speak to hyperpigmentation and enrichly melanated skin tones that deal with our concerns? You can't just do one product and expect everyone to come running. So color extension to me, I think is wonderful when people can tout that. But once again, also, do you have a spokesperson? Do you have someone speaking this language? I'm tired of people thinking it used to be the supermodel. But, oh, we've got a black model now. Okay, but you don't even have a product or a shade to match her. And we've seen so many iterations of these stories that I carry my baggage to every counter because I can't drop it off yet. Because every time I see a color that does work, I'm also thrown off by the fact that I can't buy a loose powder or a pressed powder or richly pigmented blusher or eyeshadows that speak to this skin tone. And if you don't have those things, then I can't do a full face so that you can't really service me. You're just giving me an appetizer. I want a meal. Oh, I love that. And that is very true. And You know, you can do the good work, but if the buyer is not doing the job or you're not restocking when we buy it, then we're still going to the counter and saying, oh, we still don't have anything for you. I'll just never forget. I had a guest on this podcast who started her business. She was an attorney. She started her business because black women goes to Sephora and there is no concealer for her in Washington, D.C. But they want us to make do because they will then start showing us other things, multi-purpose ways that you can use these other products, but they're not meant for that. The luxury of privilege 
is being able to have products created specifically for you in a range. General Market gets their concealers, they get their foundations, they get a number of foundations from tinted moisturizers to full coverage and loose and pressed powders with choices and personality attached. We don't have that yet. We still don't have that. I think we've seen many brands that are being born for specific personalities, but until we can have not as many brands as the general market brands, but as many brands and products that speak to our specific needs, we will be satisfied. Where is the mature skin foundation? Where's the BB and CC creams for us? So those are the kinds of things like we don't get a chance to participate in the product trends because it's too costly for them to dive into these deeper shades in in a real meaningful way. So it's like drawing on a bone. Yeah. Well, we have something here for you, but it's not the full meal. It goes back to that meal for sure. Wow. That is very powerful and very, very true. What is it like to be part of the renaissance of Fashion Fair, the reinvigoration and the rebirth of Fashion Fair? Beyonce said it best. It's a homecoming. Everyone loves a homecoming. It's the school that you go back to. It is the college. It is the class reunion. It is the place where you feel most welcome. And when Desiree Rogers and Cheryl McKissick purchased the brand, and relaunched it, I was one of the first calls that they made because it was something that was near and dear to my heart. I was so happy that they made that call. I had just moved back to New York. I was considering doing cosmetics and I ran into Desiree at the lab. And you know, they always say there are no accidents. And she said, we need to talk. And she had the right idea. She was like, I don't want to do 40 to 50 foundations. And I said, I don't think you need to. I think you can satisfy a community of color with being more specific and understanding the nuances. I do it as a makeup artist. I don't walk around with 50 shades of foundation in my cosmetic kit. I walk around with about 10 to 12 possibly, you know, for the most part. So it's easy for me. And I wanted this to be easy. She wanted to bring back some really keen formulas like cream to powder, which was very popular for fashion fair and not kind of a trend product today. But I think that cream and powder really speaks to women of color. I call it a liquid alternative. It's not as messy. It dries down to a powdery finish because most women of color consider themselves to be oily. So having a bit of a nice dry down to it, of course you can use powder with it, but being able to have that gorgeous finish and the sheerness and that dry down to a powdery finish, I think was really a great second skin alternative. Bringing back some of the iconic lipsticks in shades, chocolate raspberry and pure plum and some of those. And actually my co-branded collection from 10 years ago, one of my lipsticks has been added to the line as well called Rebel, one of the deepest, most beautiful burgundy shades there. So that was lovely. But it's great. It's great to work with family. It's great to come home to a brand that you don't have to think about what you're saying or constantly have to have a conversation about what this consumer needs in comparison to their general market consumer. Right. As opposed to let's not forget where it's all about what she needs or whoever the person is that wants to wear the product. Yes what they need. We're not in a room talking about what Black women want and in comparison to our general market consumer, our white women. We're not saying, well, Black women need this and Black women need this. No, every conversation is about her. It's not in comparison. It is in celebration. And I think that's the difference. Big difference. Now, You said you moved back to New York. We have not yet even talked about your years in Hollywood. We've got to talk about it because that's working in different medium, film and television. Nobody could get me out of New York but Queen Latifah. (laughs) And nobody could bring me back but Queen Latifah. So seven years ago, she had the Queen Latifah show and we were doing HSN. She had a brand, a clothing brand on And man, we were in the parking lot. I remember it as clear as day. She said, so Sam, I'm doing this talk show. You're going to come? I was like, really? 
you think? And she was like, yeah, it's time. I had been in New York since I was 17 years old. And I wanted to see something different. I wanted to see a different part of the industry. Of course, I had been to LA several times, many, many, many times for work, but I never thought about living there. And it was an interesting time. I moved out there and worked on the show for two years. It ended. I said, let me move around a little. Let me move to Oakland. Let me see what Oakland's like. I enjoyed the day. You know, it was near wine country. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed Santa Barbara and traveling there and Palm Springs. Because when you're here, we just go to Miami. We go to all the islands because they're close. And who's trying to go to Mexico and Hawaii? It's a longer flight when we have all of these wonderful islands here. So moving to L.A. was really an interesting journey. I yearned for New York. I enjoyed the weather. I got fit. I did all the hikes. I did Runyon Canyon. I did all the things you're supposed to do. But ultimately, it never felt as good as being in New York did. And I came running home when Queen Latifah was offered the equalizer. We came back to do the pilot. And, you know, we were shut down during COVID. But once things picked up, I came back to start the equalizer. I worked there for four months before it ended. But between that time, like, gosh, I've done movies with Nia Long. I've done Angela Bassett for 911. I did Queen Latifah when she did a guest role in Hollywood as Hattie McDaniels. So being on that side of Hollywood is very different. Also, I'm a union member. So coming a part of the union, getting health benefits, getting union benefits and pension, I'm vested now. It's a very different side of the union because as a freelancer, we're on our own. There is no union and editorial rates are still the same and they're going to still make you wait to get paid. And there's no recourse. (laughs) Exactly. But the length of time that you have to wait to get paid is even longer than it used to be. Yo, and we need to band together. Honestly, there are the freelancers laws. And ultimately, I'm in a position in my career now where I can choose to not accept certain payment terms. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's abusive to ask someone to wait 75 days for payment or to wait 60 days. Sometimes 90. Who is doing a job and waiting 90 days for payment? When you hired me, you knew what the rate was and you knew what you were going to pay. Why should I have to wait 90 days to receive it? So some of that is abusive to me. And fortunately, I'm at the place in my career where I can turn some of those things down. But I've watched people jump through many hoops, many, many hoops to make sure that they get what their celebrity, that they're hiring, that they want to be a part of that job. I've watched them. Monique was amazing at that. She had a check from a client that she agreed to work for. She made sure that that check was at my hotel when I landed. It begins with the power of the client. If the client and management believe in satisfying you, satisfying the client's needs, then that means that you can get what you want. If that's a car, if that's a different flight, if that's payment in advance, if that's payment on time, if that's payment at the end of the job, if that's payment in cash. I used to work with Aretha Franklin and she said, yo, Aretha would be like, Sam, give me a minute. I'd come back, I'd see $100 wrappers that bind the bills together, and I knew she had just gotten paid. The deal can be whatever you want, and I've learned that, and I've learned that, and I talked to so many other artists about making sure that you get what you negotiate. You don't get what's given, you get what you negotiate. That's very important. Very important, and I think that there are a lot of things at play. When you know the value that you're giving to someone, then you negotiate. You can also negotiate when you're first starting out, but please make sure that you can deliver on what you're promising. But the work is easy, Corin. I don't think the work is the issue. I think it's just more about kids not even realizing what the standards are in this industry and what you can do. It's like Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder owning their masters. And you're seeing Taylor Swift now re-recording things so she can own her masters. And Ashanti just... Um, re-recording hers. That's right. Yep. 
So you have to change the game and you have to watch what's happening. You don't get to a point in your career and then say, now I'm going to do things differently. I'd be standing with the hair stylist and the stylist and someone would walk over and give me an envelope and they would say to me, Sam, what's that? I was like, oh, it's my check. You got paid today? I was like, yeah, because I negotiated that. There's a production company. You're doing a music video. The record label gives money to the production company. Where do you think the trailers are coming from? Where do you think all of the lighting equipment is coming from? Somebody had to put money up. My money is this small in the scheme of things. Run it to me. Run me my money. Run it. You came to prominence before Instagram. Yes. Let's talk about then versus now in terms of what you're able to do. So your career has many levels from store to spokesperson. It's not going to be easy to replicate that. Yes, a young person can, in the age of Instagram, make a name for themselves. But in as many places, it may be difficult because all of those avenues are not available now. We've become so much more disposable. Mm -hmm. Buy into them here, buy into them there. This brand, get the look. It's like a buffet. Having a brand believe in you as a voice, having your clients believe in you, being able to walk it and talk it is very different today. I mean, you have a lot of people, Jackie Aina and Makeup by Shayla. There's so many wonderful people who are producing so much great content, but they become a house and a home into themselves. That's why they then start putting out product. But for a makeup artist like myself, who, you know, I'm thinking about product. I always think about product. I've had several deals back and forth, but to be a part of a brand and to be able to exist and expand your own brand within that brand, I think is really special. But let me say it this way. Careers like mine won't really exist anymore because the magazine isn't in charge of hiring the makeup and hairstylist and the stylist anymore. And when Beyonce comes into Vogue and she is not only bringing her team, but she's also telling them to hire this black photographer, which kudos to her, you know, the first black photographer in what, 175 years of publishing at Vogue. I get it. That's amazing. But what we lose as freelancers is our opportunity to gain that leg up by being in the editorial market. So I was both editorial. Then I was also working with celebrities, doing music videos and appearances. Then I was cosmetic and I was able to become a spokesperson while doing Veronica Webb for Revlon and Tyra Banks for CoverGirl and Queen Latifah for CoverGirl. And then be able to go into the labs and develop brands like Black Opal and go into the lab and help fashion fair. So those multidimensional careers, once again, I don't think they really exist. I think everybody's for themselves these days. So it doesn't go back to the brand. We become the brands. I've always seen myself as a brand, but I've also lent my voice to the brands that I know and love and that speak to women of color in affirming ways. I don't know that that's going to exist without these artists doing their own brands. But everybody shouldn't have to have their own brand to have a voice. And here is the conundrum with everyone for themselves. The whole idea for many to start their own brand is to exit. So it's not about you anymore. It's about the bag, securing the bag. And you know what? Money is wonderful. But if we're talking about creating things that drive culture mm -hmm. and change lives. Because once it's purchased, and we've seen this, I walk past Tiffany's now knowing that Tiffany's was purchased by LVMH and they've got scaffolding up. Change is coming. You've already seen Tiffany's team up with Supreme. Now they're doing a, you know, their co-branded collection. It's never as authentic as it is when I remember when Kevin Kwan launched Kevin Kwan Beauty. I remember when Bobby Brown launched Bobby Brown Beauty. These brands changed. I remember Frank and Frank. Oh, Frank and Frank. Oh my God, Frank Tusk in my heart. I loved him. Yeah, so you know that these brands are going to change because they want to meet the broader needs and the trends of many. You know, that's the challenge, even with wanting to launch brands for 
people of color, is that how far reaching can this be? But I went to Nigeria and did an appearance at a Mac store for one of their biggest, let me say this the right way, their largest sub-Saharan region store. And it was in Nigeria. And they're not getting all the collections. They didn't even have a makeup artist discount at the time. So it's hard to become a global brand today without teaming up with the big fives. And even if you want to get your bag and leave, what are you leaving with? Did you leave the DNA of the brand? Because sometimes that is you. When I know that Bobby Brown is no longer at Bobby Brown Cosmetics, I don't see it the same. And looking at Dean and Dean, it's Smashbox. You can tell when the DNA Horse Data Beta. Yes, very good. Big difference. When Soft Sheen was purchased by L'Oreal. I mean, we can go on and on and talk about all the brands that have been purchased. I mean, that's why I love what Lisa Price has done because her voice and her DNA has remained. Right, the imprint. Yes, and that's very important. I don't think you can get rid of us as easily as you can sometimes general market creators, because what we know about our customer and what we know about our community is right here in the heart. Absolutely. What would you like to do next? You know, it's interesting because I'm talking to you as a friend. We've been in this industry for so long and a lot of things come up when you say that. This isn't just an interview. I'm really in conversation with you. And a lot of things come up. The comparison to be able to not be at the helm of a brand and create a brand and not need to do that and just make money just because you're a talented artist and just become a spokesperson and live life happily ever after and continue your artistry would be great. That has never been my experience. I will always be an artist who has to go and get it. I will always have to pitch it. I will always have to help them see it. I will always have to be turned down when they don't see it. Everybody's not for us, even in this age of diversity. And it's very challenging to find your footing as an artist, where I can look at many of my white counterparts who have deals with cosmetic brands long standing and editorial work. I look at many. I follow Dick Page. I am such a fan of his work and our work is so different, but I love what he does. And he was with Shiseido and he's still working at Vogue and he's had a long standing career. We don't get a chance. When I look at Roxana Floyd, who passed away, of course, but I look at her career, I look at Reggie Wells, we don't have the kind of careers where we get a chance to kind of be celebrated by brands and still be an authority. I feel that part of my legacy is going to be still in books and in product. And at 52 years old, I'm going to have to create both of those, both the business plans and pitch them and get turned down and pitch them again and raise money and find people who will support it and come out and do that thing. That has been my experience. It doesn't get easier just because you have a name. You're going to get a meeting. That's what the name gets you, but it doesn't always get you the deal. Because the ability to see what you see, sometimes it's yours and yours alone. You can't imprint that on someone else. This isn't regular business. Like you said, this is legacy business. This is real. This is business for the culture also because you're creating for the culture and creating something that lasts. Yes. As opposed to for the culture in 2021. Or from January to June 2021. I mean, things are short-lived. But what I am talking about is that someone could listen to this in 10 years and say, wow, I know who Sam Fine is. <laughs> I understand kind of the impact. And I got into this business because I saw the work that Sam Fine did. Like, you never know what kind of impact you have on people. That is kind of the genius of what we do. So it is hard. And I hear you, my brother. I hear you in terms of that you are the person that's going to have to push your agenda forward because no one's coming with the silver platter going, Sam, fine, this is for you. We don't have that luxury. We're always going to have to put in the extra sweat. We're going to have to be doing three times as much work to get the deal. The deal will not always be as lucrative as someone else's. 
yet and still we have to do it because that is why we're here. And I think about my legacy all the time. When I did that book at 27, I was thinking about my legacy. I was focused on the fact that we have to be able to see more of ourselves in the same way that they view other artists. I'm pitching a new book, a retrospective, and I want to leave that book for all of the makeup artists still to come because I want them to know all of the things that they can do. No, I don't have a YouTube channel and I don't have 5 million followers on Instagram, but the work of what I come to do, that's what I want them to understand, to focus on the work. And that is something that I think escapes the youth. It escapes me sometimes. Every time I'm scrolling on Instagram, I forget why I'm on there. I'm so distracted. But I think legacy building is something that you are laser focused on. And you always know that you're leaving something that is so important. I came up in the 80s, early 90s, and the AIDS crisis, and many of my friends in the creative industry were dying. And to know that life is so short, I'm so fortunate to have my dad who's 90 and my mom who's 82, but to know that their stories may never get told. To be a celebrated artist just gives me a platform to be able to inspire others for years to come. And I don't take that lightly. I don't take my position lightly. And that's why I push forward in every direction I can. Right. And we grow weary and well-doing. You know, we hear that all the time. But we must press. Got to press. Press toward the markets. I mean, if you're here for a purpose, that purpose does not change. You know what your assignment is and the way in which you go about it may change, but it is always for a bigger purpose. It's not just about the makeup. It's about inspiring people. I was starting to laugh when you said knowing the assignment because the kids say that now. Yeah. Understand the assignment. I understood the assignment, but this assignment is a little bit bigger. But I've always understood the assignment. Every time I come to work, I understand the assignment. These women aren't just on the red carpet. These are events. These are things that everybody is going to remember for years to come. I'm working with groundbreaking first time everything celebrities, athletes, stars. So it's more than me. Finally, in this last section of the podcast, I want to leave our listeners with some concrete steps on where to begin. So let's go into our starting five that take away tips from our guests. In this last section, I want to ask you to offer someone who's interested in makeup artistry five tips for creating a lasting career. Take it seriously. It begins with you. I can go back to my first business card my comp card, and it still reflects the artist that I am today. You got to take yourself seriously. I think a lot of people enter into this industry thinking that it's a hobby. It's fun. This is a huge industry and the weight that will rest on your shoulders over doing someone's makeup well. Oh, wow. You have no idea. So take yourself seriously. If you're going to enter into this industry, call yourself by your name. I don't want to see a version of your name. I am Sam Fine is my Instagram name. I understand how catchy some of these other phrases are, and I've watched people take back their names. Look at Samuel Jackson. You say Sam Jackson, now it's Samuel. He had to really own that name again. I think that's the first step. Marketing is everything. You are your brand. What you post, what you show, how you show up. I think we hear that the adage, you're on time, the meeting starts at one and you're there at one, you're already late. You gotta show up early. I'm the first person. In fact, Cynthia Revo, every time I come to her, she's like, Sam, you're like 25 minutes early. And I'm like, well, I need to set up. I need to get my head right. So learn that being early is a good thing, even if it puts your soul at rest, knowing that you've figured out where you're going, you've figured out what you're wearing, and to be able to present yourself in a way that represents your brand. 
I think kids know today that they are a brand from their Instagram channels to their YouTube channels to the way they show up. I think we know that more than ever. But knowing what it is you're doing, going to the craft and being able to do whatever it is someone wants, because they're never wrong. I tell people all the time, and I've had arguments about it. I'm in the service industry. I provide a service. I'm a servant. So whatever it is you want, I should be able to provide. You want glitter today? Okay, I may not think it's appropriate, but I got it. It's in my bag. You know, I try to have real conversations when I feel that this isn't the right thing. And having a list of achievements, I don't care if you just write it down on a little piece of paper, things that you want to achieve. They may seem so great to you right now, but they will be things that you will walk into in your future. You have no idea. Oh, that's such a powerful statement. Those are some amazing tips. And they're tips for anybody in any career. I don't care if you're, you know, clean the bathroom. It's the way in which you show up to do whatever your calling is. So even if you're not in makeup artistry, I'm just saying to the listeners, just heed the things that Sam just offered because they are just a prescription for life in a lot of ways and for having a fulfilling career. And that's really important. I knew that I was coming on this podcast with you and you said, oh, we're filming it as well. So that meant I had to pull up a light. You know, the light goes down at 5 p.m. I had to pull out my nice fancy background for y'all because it's part of my brand. And I think that more people are learning that. But the minute you start really investing in these things, investing in yourself, the more you see the returns. The universe answers you all the time. You know, if you don't know something, ask somebody. I get DMs all the time and I do respond. And there's so much information online nowadays. There's no reason for any question to go and answer. We grew up in an era where we had to pick up the phone and pray that someone would answer it and have the time to explain something to us. Now you just type it in. (laughs) And, you know, if you don't ask, you won't get. So it is incumbent on everyone to just go after what you want, but also be prepared. (laughs) Be prepared. Do the work first. Do the work. I'm really a big fan of Stephen Pressfield's book, Do the Work, because the only way it gets done is if you do it. (laughs) And the last thing I always say to my assistants, I say is to my friend, actually a model friend of mine who had an idea, go get your no. Woo! I'm sorry. That's so good. Say it again. Go get your no. If the worst thing you can say to me is no, not at this time, then when? Well, come back in four months. I'll be here. Well, not right now. Then when? Well, this doesn't seem like the right fit for us. That's fine because you won't be here forever. You have to go get your no. These words don't hold anything. They're just someone else's words. The power is in you. And I choose not to give any negativity, not that no is even negative. It just may not work for them. That's great because I want to find the best fit for me too. Yes. And on that note, my friend, this has been just an incredible chance to share, to hear about your career. You know, I know it's going to bless everyone that listens to this. Uh, Well, thank you so much for having me. Like you said, we have known each other for a long, 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 long time. And so I look forward to more of these conversations because I do know that our community is cyclical. You see the same folks all the time. Somebody gets fired, somebody gets hired. You get a chance to know them just the same. So it is lovely having this moment with you and I look forward to many more conversations. Absolutely. (laughs) That's our show for today. If you have questions about where to start in your beauty career, drop us a line at hello at beautybizcamp.com. Remember, there are many roads to success, but each of them requires you to start. So take that step forward today. See you next time.